Hello and welcome to the How to Pass Guide for Advanced Higher History. My name is Derek Darkins, I'm the Principal Teacher at the Faculty of Humanities at Dunoon Grammar School and I'm the teacher of this course. This video will uh, give you an insight into what the Advanced Higher History course involves at Dunoon Grammar School, what your young person will be learning about and I'll also give you some hints and tips on how you can support them to achieve in the course this year. To begin, Advanced High History is split into two component parts. Firstly, the question paper is a formal exam the pupils will sit in the May exam diet and it consists of two essays and three source questions for which they have three hours to answer. The second component is the project dissertation. This is a year long project that the students work on um, throughout the course of the year from September through to April when, when they return from the Easter holidays they must produce a final draft to be printed and posted to the SQA. The purpose and the aims of the Advanced Higher History course is to get the pupils up to the next level and ready to make that jump to university. We are equipping them with the social and the academic skills to thrive in the university environment. So instead of sitting in a classroom where they will learn with their peers from a teacher um, and from textbooks about uh, the needs and requirements of a higher course, an advanced higher, the learning is much more independent. Uh, pupils will take part in seminars about different course topics. They will be tasked with research tasks. They will be uh, taught how to analyze, evaluate and research independently. Uh, and to investigate different texts and academic sources which they will use for their responses. Uh, we also encourage them to develop their essay writing skills and also their skills of debate as a regular part of the course is to take part in seminars to discuss the key factors and issues as we work our way through the contents of the course. This is about building not only their academic ability in terms of cobbling together a university level essay and giving them that step up over their peers when they make that jump. But it's also about developing their personal confidence, uh, their interpersonal social skills that will allow them to take part in university seminars and to thrive in that environment. This, as much as that grade, that hopeful A that they're going to get in Advanced High History, is one of the big takeaways from the actual experience of sitting this course. Our course content at Dunoon Grammar School uh, covers one area of historical study. The one we do is Northern Britain, and that covers the period from the Iron Age, around about 0 AD, through to 1034 and the formation of Alba, or Scotland, as a country. We look at that group of people um, living in the, the sets of Northern Britain's Iron Age tribes, how they interacted with each other, and then how they responded to successive waves of invaders that came and influenced their culture until they form their own nation state. Um, during the course of these studies, we will be um, developing our research skills. And not only will pupils undergo lecture type sessions where the teacher will lead them through content, they're also very much so encouraged to carry out their own research on an academic level, accessing um, historians and academic journals and online articles to build up their own research and their own picture of what's going on. They'll use this to express themselves in their essays and their source questions and to demonstrate that they have a deep understanding of the various issues um, going on in Northern Britain at this time. And in detail then, this is what our course covers during the course of the year. Now unlike higher history where you have a Scottish unit and a British unit and a European world unit, in advanced higher history, it's very much like doing a module at first year university. It is on one area, one given area. And as previously said, we span uh, Northern Britain from the Iron Age through to 1034. Now the summary here shows you what we'll be looking at in class. Um, in the June term, in August, we look at Iron Age society uh, with a focus on power, beliefs and hierarchy within um, different tribal states. Uh, we then look at the Roman invasions, uh, we spend some time on that, that will take us through to about the start of November, and then we begin to look at post-Roman Northern Britain. So we look at the arrival of Christianity, we'll look at individual different um, societies such as the Picts in the North East, the Britons in the South West, the Scots of Dalriada in the West, here in Argyle, uh, along with the Angles who colonised Lothian in the South East of what we would call Scotland today. 
Uh, this culminates with the arrival of the Vikings that uh, disrupt the apple cart uh, tremendously uh, before they themselves come here and settle. Uh, we round off by looking at the establishment of the Kingdom of Alba, how a country, uh, as we might identify with it today, emerges from this, this mess of different nations. And this will take us through all the way to April. Now the exam, what will your young person face um, come the May exam diet? The exam itself is worth 90 marks of the 140 they have available from the advanced higher course. And it is divided into two sections. The standard length of exam is three hours, although if your young person is able to access additional assessment arrangements, um, extra time could extend this period. And that's something we very much will work to prepare them for uh, in advance of this. This will probably be the longest exam they will face in their lives to this point. Part one of the exam is the essay section. Students will be faced with five advanced higher essays uh, when they open up that exam in May, of which they have to answer two of their choice. Now the essays are sampled from the, the five course areas previously mentioned in this video, uh, and not necessarily one essay per section of the course. Sometimes they put two in from one area. For instance, we might get two Romans essays. Uh, our students should budget to allow themselves roughly two minutes per mark, so that gives them 50 minutes to write each essay out under exam conditions, unless they have uh, additional assessment arrangements that give them extra time. An advanced higher history essay is very much like a higher history essay, so students shouldn't be daunted by making the jump up to this level, as they already have the skills in the bank, as it were, if they've um, basically thought about picking this as an option. One key difference, however, is that to pass an advanced higher history essay, our students must reference two historians to pass. That means they need to quote or refer to the view of historians at least twice during an essay to get a pass mark of 13 or above. Now, as we go through the course, this is something we drill into the students. We get them to consistently take down notes of historians' views, to highlight them as we come across them in our different lectures or PowerPoints or when we um, share material in seminars and uh, group discussion um, so that our pupils build up a, a kind of bank of historians that they can shoehorn in to um, any essay that might come their way. And this is very much something that we focus on through the length of our course. Now, I've taken here screenshots from the marking instructions on the most recent Advanced Higher History Pass Paper. You can access this on the SQA Advanced Higher History website and clicking on Pass Papers and then clicking on Marking Instructions. It's about four pages into the marking instruction. Now, this is what the SQA markers use when they are marking uh, the essays from the exams of our young people's scripts. Now the way it works on this grid is that we want to be as far as possible towards the right hand side of the page. Um, so there are four different drivers. We've got two on this page here. Those are the things on the left hand side which says structure and thoroughness. Structure is how our candidates are laying out their essays. Is it paragraphed? Does it have an introduction that introduces what the essay is going to talk about? As in what factors are going to be included? And does the candidate tell us a line of argument? Have they told us what their preferred factor or answer is for the essay right at the start. We're also looking to see, do we have a relevant conclusion there where the candidate actually gives an answer to the essay question at the end? Uh, the more rigorous they are in this, the further to the right-hand side of this table they are. Uh, the next heading on the left-hand side down there, thoroughness and relevance of information. This is basically in higher essay terms, the KU, the knowledge and understanding, the actual hard facts that they're able to uh, include in their essay. The more facts that they get in, the further to the right of this diagram, once again they are. When writing an essay, we are looking for the students to give a fact that's relevant to the factor they're talking about and then explain it. So give me some extra explanation about it or give me some uh, examples um, to basically big up the, the item that they are currently talking about. For example, if the essay was about the Iron Age and they were wanting to talk about the role of a hill fort, they would give an example of something hill folks do, as in they were used as meeting places. And then they would exemplify this by giving an example of a hill fort where that's the case, such as the brown catahuns in Dundee, or near Dundee. Moving on, 
The next part of the essay marking scheme is analysis and evaluation, as we can see on the left-hand side there. Now that is when our students give a point of KU in their essay. We're then looking for them to analyse what that tells us about the factor. So that shows us either the factor is important or is not important. The student can give us reasons to, to big up the factor or they can give us reasons to, to give some balance to tell us why that factor maybe isn't so as important as another. The more uh, rigorous they are in doing this, the further to the right-hand side of this marking scheme they're going to be. We're always looking to be at least in the third column for 13 to 14. That's our pass mark. So if our essay matches up with the statements in that column, then we're really uh, going quite far towards getting that mark for our essay. The further to the right we get, the higher the grade is going to be. Finally, um, historiography or historical sources. How much um, historiography or quotes from historians are the candidates able to bring to their essay? The further to the right they're going to be is going to be relying on how they use that historiography. If they're just getting a couple of points in and they just drop it into their essay, then they're sitting at the 13 to 14 column. That's the basic awareness of historians' interpretations. If they're able to use quotes from historians to back up their argument or to back up a piece of analysis or evaluation, or even better, the gold standard, if they can uh, recall historians that have opposing views. For instance, Breeze thinks the Romans did conquer northeastern Britain, whereas perhaps uh, Moffat thinks the evidence points to the fact that the Romans uh, were only here briefly and they were forced out. If we can show opposition between historians, that is the gold standard we're aiming for our candidates to get to, and that's going to push them up towards the 23 to 25 bracket where they'll be getting A pluses. That's really where we want them to be. But obviously, under exam conditions, that's not always possible. So that's an idea of how an SQA marker might be looking to mark the The second part of the exam paper our students will face in May is the source questions, of which they will face three. These are worth 40 marks as opposed to the paper two of the higher exam, which had 36 marks for the four source questions there. Uh, the extra demand in advanced hire really comes from the fact the sources themselves are a bit longer. There's uh, much more information for the pupils to kind of sift through. And the final two marks on each of the three questions there come from uh, providing historiography, uh, which is novel to advanced hire. Unlike the essays where our students can't get a passing mark unless they provide historiography, so they get capped at 12 out of 25, in the source questions, it's purely just the last two marks that um, are provided for through historiography. So if they can't remember um, anything to add in, they can still, for instance, get 10 out of 12 or 14 out of 16. And now the other course component we have other than the exam paper is the dissertation. So this is a year long project our pupils undertake. Um, it is basically a giant essay that they research themselves and write up and redraft through the course of the year. And this is where parents can really make a difference. Um, the essay itself is worth 50 marks. It is chosen, you know, the topic of it is chosen from a list provided by SQA. There's 50 different essay questions that pupils can basically take their pick from. Um, it's an extended essay uh, and they will analyse the various different factors that go into their topic question. They'll research them, analyse them and explore historians' views and basically evaluate them and come to a conclusion and make a decision on the topic. Now the rules our students have got to stick to is that they're given a max word count of 4,000. Now the actual maximum word count is a plus 10% limit. Now 4,000 words to a sixth year pupil, it seems like a really long essay. Um, and to be fair, it is. When they're in first year uni, they're only turning out essays of around about 1,500 to 2,000 words. So it is, it is long. Um, but by the time they get to the end of the year, they will be struggling, believe me, to fit their essay into that word count. We're allowed that plus 10% margin. So as long as we don't go past 4,400, we won't get penalised for it. To pass the dissertation and get more than um, 25 out of 50, we need to include at least two relevant primary sources. So for instance, if it's on a Roman topic, we're wanting to see uh, quotes from contemporary Roman writers like Tacitus or Pliny about what's going on. 
Their bibliography needs to be provided at the end of their dissertation. So that's a list of all the historians they used, any like books, articles, essays, websites that they sampled when they're writing their dissertation should be included there. And this does not count towards their word count. Uh, when they quote historians of primary sources, or even when they're making a, a serious point in the midst of the dissertation, we need our students to be footnoting um, their sources, basically. Um, they can use the Harvard or the Oxford system. Now you can, obviously, this video is long enough already, you can Google uh, the expectations of both those systems quite quickly on YouTube to find out how to lay that out, or you can contact me on the email address at the end of this video, and I'll provide you with more information. Um, but they need to reference as a key component part of the dissertation. Finalised dissertations are going to be printed and stuck in an envelope and sent off to the SQA a couple of days after our students come back from the Easter holiday. So the Easter break is really their last opportunity to polish off that final draft. The deadline is non-negotiable. A white van will come and will take it away and they must have the dissertation done by that time. So how else can um, parents support their young people through the Advanced Higher History course? Well, uh, in terms of getting resources, the Humanities faculty has got an excellent library of texts to support this topic area, so our students will never be short of books to access. To go deeper, um, you can help them access the Mitchell Library, which is free to use in Glasgow. They're not allowed to take books away from it, but they can go and visit the library and access the books in there. They're able to photocopy sections that they need, or else carry out, I guess, university-style research using the library and taking notes that they need. Um, there will be a trip organised to the Mitchell Library before Christmas to show our students where the library is and how to use the cataloguing system to find the books they need. You can help as well with organisation. Now imagine the workload of an advanced hire can be something that is quite hard to do for some of our students. Um, it's really, really uh, important that we don't let the workload build up on them and they don't address it. So having lots of essays due and having not engaged with dissertation can suddenly seem psychologically like an awful lot. So it's important to keep on chipping away at the work as it comes through and to support your young person in doing that. Checking in regularly with them to, to check on their progress will help to keep them on track. If you are concerned, uh, you can contact me at the email address shown on the screen. I'll be happy to help at any time. Um, I'd also advise that you encourage your young person to read regularly. Now, that could just be general reading of a uh, fairly uh, complex text, would be good, uh, to keep their reading level up and to boost their literacy. Um, I would encourage them to keep on reading specifically for their dissertation because uh, they're expected to reference an awful lot of historians when they do this and to take notes on a variety of different sources so it does require a lot of reading. Now I tell our students they'll never be asked to read a book from cover to cover. I always advise them go to the contents, find the chapter that's relevant to what you need and if in the first couple of pages of that chapter it has not been made clear that it's relevant to them, ditch it and move on to the next book. The most they'll need in a chapter is probably 20 to 25 pages. The index is also useful for narrowing in uh, on specific points they might need to find out about. So they'll make their way through a number of books fairly quickly if they uh, concentrate on it. Ask to see teacher feedback and discuss the next steps with your child. Now, they'll regularly be getting essays and source questions uh, to submit and these will be handed back to them with comments on, with the marking grids we showed earlier on the video. Please do have a look at these and ask to see them um, for your own person and comment on them. Uh, discuss it with them, like how they're doing and what the next steps are, uh, and share that journey with them as they work their way through the course. It will help to keep them engaged and help to keep them on track. They will also regularly submit parts of or drafts of the dissertation too, which likewise will be returned with feedback and comments, so do please ask to see that and check in with them on how it's going. Some useful course text to get. Now, a lot of our books uh, at the DGS library are uh, eBay purchases. There's a lot out there you can get for quite a, a, a heavy discount compared to the, the shop price. Um, that text on the left by Tim Clarkson, The Makers of Scotland, that is an overview of our entire course in one book. And it kind of goes through the different ages, chapter by chapter. Clarkson can be quite analytical and it can be a wee bit heavy, but he covers the entire course content in a couple of hundred pages. It is an excellent book. You can pick it up for around eight or nine pounds. The middle book and the example of the Making of Scotland series. These are available in Historic Scotland sites, um, although they're easier to get off Amazon, realistically, or eBay. Um, it's a series of books, and basically the Advanced High History course follows these books. 
They do a book on the Iron Age, they do a book on the Roman invasions, they do a book on the Picts. So each major section of our course is supported by one of these books is around about kind of 40 to 50 pages. These are also available for under a tenner. If your child is picked to do, for instance, Picts for the visitation, the book on Picts as shown here is a go-to text for them to use. I have these in the school. Uh, but a golden rule for the DGS library is that our pupils do not write in or highlight any of the text. If they want to annotate the books, they should pick up their own copy. As I said, they're cheap and easy to get second-hand. The book on the right-hand side uh, by Alistair Moffat, like Clarkson, covers the whole of our period, but Moffat's style is much easier and much more accessible. He likes to tell more of a story and less of, um, um, I guess, less aggressive with the analytical uh, facts and evaluation of, of the source content. No less valuable for that, um, and he's very, very engaging. Uh, if our pupils uh, really do want to read and find out more about this period, then the faded map is where you should start. Once again, it's available for about £8 um, on Amazon, or probably a little bit less on eBay. Places to visit. Now, the interesting thing about doing a course on Northern British history is that some of the key sites that we're going to learn about in class are accessible. Our people can, can get out there and see them. Due to the age of some of these sites, and some of them, there's not a great deal to see, but um, I've included a wee short list here of where the things are clustered. Mitchell Library is up there first and foremost for the books that they can access for free. Um, the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh, floor zero, the basement level, is where our period is, and there is a wonderful collection of Iron Age, Roman, early Christian and Viking artefacts, and there's some real treasures there too. The Govan Stones at Govan Old Parish Kirk in Govan. So it's the opposite side of the river from the Transport Museum. Um, there's a collection of early medieval uh, relics from about 1,000 to 1,100 years ago. They are outstanding. There's nothing like it in Britain. It's free to access. It's run by a charity. It's open most afternoons uh, at the weekend if there are young people want to pop in and see. The volunteers there are always more than happy to talk about what they've got there too. It's great. For us in Argyll, Dunad, which is a hill fort um, in Kilmartin Glen, about three miles northeast of northwest sorry, of Loch Gilphead, about a two mile drive, two hour drive, sorry, away from Dunoon, is a stunning site. It is the capital of the Kingdom of Dalriada, which we're going to learn about in class, covering about a course of about three weeks or so. So it's going to be a key part of their studies, and that is a truly, truly um, remarkable site to visit. There's nothing else like it in the UK and probably in Europe, but it's brilliant and it's on our doorstep. Hadrian's Wall, the class uh, usually do a trip out to Hadrian's Wall, but there are key museums in the centre um, of the wall where it goes over the top of Pennines. Uh, the Fort at Housesteads run by English Heritage and the Fort of Vindolanda and the accompanying Roman Army Museum are excellent. And there's yearly um, excavations at Vindolanda, which if the pupils visit between June and September, they will be able to see in progress, which is that's just phenomenal. Excellent, excellent resources really give a flavour uh, to the pupils of what the Roman invasion was like. I've put in St Vigian's Museum in Arbroath. Now, I would always check online if that's open or not, if they are interested in finding out about the Picts. That, as far as I can ascertain, is the best cluster of Pictish stones and artefacts in Scotland. And it's in this little museum uh, in a wee village, just a few miles north of Arbroath on east of Scotland. If you're ever over that way, it is lovely. Um, finally, kind of winding up with useful websites to see, Tim Clarkson, the, the author of that first book I recommended, has a blog where he um, focuses in on different aspects of early medieval Scotland. Excellent resource and can be quoted in dissertations and essays galore. Mr. Marr is something our pupils have used in National 5 and in High History. He provides a website and a YouTube channel with a guide on how to do each one of the different types of source questions in Advanced High History along with the essays. Very useful. And there's a couple of YouTube channels in there as well that have useful associated videos. When lockdown happened and COVID, it pushed a lot of the academic seminars online for the first time. So we've got videos of these lectures that they read about in books actually on the screen telling them about their stuff. So it's a useful resource there. And finally, the SQA Advanced Higher History page has our course documents and past papers there which you can access um, to help support your child as they prepare for that final exam. And that's where we finish off. The final exam in 2023 will be on May the 2nd. Three-hour exam for our pupils to prepare for and show what they have learned in this course. If you need to uh, know more or you are curious about anything at all, please do, uh, do not hesitate to drop me an email at the address shown here. Thanks very much for listening. Goodbye.